And we're back. And with me today is uh, Jan Ditaku. Ah, uh, yes. I think it would be better, you know, or easier if you're just like, yeah, I, I, I didn't bring Ditaku this time. <laughs> this bother. time I didn't actually bother bringing that guy. Yeah, that jerk. <laughs> ah, the Tomo Bros roll together, what can I say? This is the Hipster Snack, and today we're going to follow up on a little bit of a promise from uh, the Castlevania video. When we talked about uh, talking about our tabletop gaming experiences. So whatever footage you're seeing on screen is just whatever I felt like recording and sticking to this video after the fact. Uh, knowing, knowing you, Snack, it's going to be like Deep Rock Galactic or <laughs> Dwarf Fortress. I mean, something like that. <laughs> Dwarf Fortress could be fun. I had to, to play another game of that. And uh, we have played many tabletop games in our time, and even a couple times attempted to surmount the obstacle that is time zones in order to do some uh, live tabletop gaming for your entertainment, but a lot of technical issues and a lot of scheduling issues have prohibited us from doing so. So today we're going to reminisce about some of our older games and the outcomes of those. Yep. So, so where should we begin? Do you want to start with uh, with Kestrel or? Yeah, we should we should probably start with that group because I mean, if if we talk about the groups before, you kind of joined into our groups that we had uh, a little bit later, so you wouldn't really be able to talk on that. So, All right. yeah, yeah. There's and there's kind of a, a through line with our groups from that point. All right, why don't you uh, take the floor, Taku, and I will defer to you for now. Oh, um, ab about, uh, well, in that group, I was playing, we were playing Exalted 3rd Edition. Um, we legally acquired, at this point, <laughs> um, the Exalted 3rd Edition, because we had, we had been talking about playing for a while. Um, Noodle, my little brother and I had played before in second edition. We really loved it, but we both more or less admitted that, yeah, there are a lot of problems with second edition. Uh, it's a great setting, but just, it's a really, really lethal setting. Yeah. And uh, the 2.5 fixes helped with that, but it basically was like adding a, a Band-Aid to a bullet wound. <laughs> there were just intrinsic problems with the numbers excuse me that um ba basically meant you had to play a certain way if you really wanted to uh not die and the problem is is that like i kind of agree with people who were like uh the chungian power combat problems that people would talk about and uh, do you do you want me to go into that at all? Uh, yeah, might as well get some context for that. Exalted's not one of the better known tabletop games. Okay, basically, you have to understand that unlike in a lot of other games, where like for instance in uh, Dark Heresy, the problem isn't so much that your character is weak. The problem is that it's really difficult to hit things. Um. Most characters, you're you're going to be, like, throwing crap at a wall until you finally, you know, hit something. And then when you do hit something, you know, that's when things explode. And, and you get to bust out those really awesome critical chart tables where, like, people's arms, you know, blow up like hand grenades. <laughs> uh, the Fantasy Flight um, Warhammer games are all really great. And it's kind of a shame that they lost the license but you know it is what it is right. time moves on um exalted kind of has the opposite problem whereas it's easy to hit things the difficult part is when you get hit pretty much every single hit that you can inflict unless you're holding back is lethal it's an incredibly incredibly lethal system and even as an exalted, you know, one of the chosen of the gods with, with like, more, according to what the core rulebook says, more power than a nuclear bomb inside your body, you're still very, very frail. Now, certain 
uh, exalt types are less prone to this, like the lunars are still incredibly, incredibly difficult to kill. It requires like two or three hits to kill them rather than just the one. Yep. Um, and so basically what would boil down to is you would be, you know, a animal, animu pretty boy with a giant, you know, Piper cub wing as a sword and you'd be trading blows with people. And basically it would boil down to, I hit, I swing at Snack, and Snack will then have to do a, uh, what they call perfect defenses, where it's a, it's a magic power that perfectly blocks my attack. And there are two of them that are really, really easy to get. There's Sevenfold Shadow Evasion, which is just a perfect, you know, uh, dodge. You get out of the way. And Heavenly Guardian Defense, where it's a perfect block. Now, there's also what they call perfect soaks, where basically it's the entire uh, thing you, you see a lot in um, superhero comics, where people just no-sell something. They just hit, they get hit, and it just does no damage. You see that occasionally in Dragon Ball, too. Yeah. Uh, and, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's a little bit harder to get. That's significantly harder to get in 3rd edition. Um, that's actually one of the, ironically, the easiest ones to get as a Lunar. Where you just like, you get hit, eh, doesn't hurt. Well, that's just kind of a Lunar. <laughs> yeah, that's just a Lunar. Lunar's entire thing is that they're werewolf, giant god monster, beast men. Uh, they're, they're, they're basically super furries. Uh, I love them so much. And they basically I, I, get their power by enduring and surviving stuff that would break lesser beings. Yeah, and they're so good. They're so fun. And they they are but the um I think there was a time when I think it was because you and Doodle swapped seats. Because one of you was GM and then one of you swapped back and we were like, How'd your character catch up to us? We're like three thousand miles away. It's like, oh I used sevenfold shadow evasion on the ocean and just dodged all the way here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah. But anyway, so that was kind of the problem is like you you had to have a perfect defense and you basically had to account for the fact that you could get attacked at any given point. So you had to have an ability that would allow you to be perceptive at all times, which there were there were a few ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh mostly for solars it would be awareness charms. Although, surprisingly, there were some in the Dodge Charm Tree, too. So, usually people would just get those. They would get um, the Surprise Sidestep Technique, which is which would allow you to dodge anything. Um, it is, I, I, I think they got rid of that charm, actually, in 3rd uh, Edition. I don't remember seeing it, but they could have also moved yeah. it to a different tree, and... Just for yeah, people I... at home who don't understand, the way a charm tree works is, for solars at least, all charms fall under their different skills. So you have, like, archery and melee and perception as trees. Yeah, charms, I suppose we should also mention, are um, their magic abilities. Basically, you could consider uh, what would what D&D &D would consider magic would be charms. Yeah. However, charms are not just, like, uh, oh, zim zim zalabim, you know, I can turn cherries to hand grenades, or, <laughs> you know, I talk about hand grenades a lot, you know, like water to wine, it's just pretty much anything, like, you can walk on walls, you can, you yep. know, speak with fish, it, a lot of things, and most of them are, at least for solars, the, the gen quote-unquote generic exalted, it's just, I can do things that people can do, but better i can instead of just running really fast i can run faster than fast i can jump over tall buildings i can build things really really well you know uh stuff like that i can yeah. survive things that would kill lesser mortals um now if you're going into like blatantly um on natural things that it depends kind of on how you describe that. But like, for instance, if you're doing something that are really wild and really bestial, that'd be more of a lunar thing. If you're doing something really subtle, 
and kind of, uh, you know, requires a lot of forethought, that's probably a sedereal thing. Um, I was about to say, if it makes no sense, it's a sedereal thing. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's that's how you pronounce that, by the way. It's, it's not, not side, side real. real. It's sedereal. I've actually, I've actually heard the developers say side real, and it's like, no, it's sedereal. It, it's Greek. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so... That, that's basically the long and short of it with power combat. You you had to be very paranoid, and you had to be... It was very lethal. And that kind of got me in trouble, because I didn't quite understand the system myself initially, and I may have killed a couple player characters. Rip, my first dragon blood. Yeah, he had it coming. Uh, he was a bit of a pompous jerk, yeah. He, he was uh, profoundly <laughs> arrogant, so I guess he just kind of got his comeuppance. But, um, so, 3rd Edition basically made that, made a number of changes, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't really agree with. But the main thing being is that, uh, instead of just being able to, oh, here's your damage track, they basically made it like the Dissidia games, whereupon you kind of have a, a oomph, or like a, uh, here's my tempo in the battle, and you will raise or lower kind of your tempo, how good you're doing in the battle, um, and then you can, once you decide to, you can either decide, oh, okay, I'm going to swap over to offense now. I'm going to be, um, actually swing at you for real, and then when you do, you reset your tempo. Mm-hmm. Um, however... I don't know. Sometimes I found that that's that's a really cool system. Sometimes I found that it is just easier to just go. You know what? I'm just gonna keep swinging at you for real, <laughs> and I'm just gonna you know be really really hyper aggressive. Yeah, there are some and, times where it's good and really well balanced, and there's other times where it turns a fight into a slog. Yeah, like uh, not for not for nothing. I realized ironically with petrol. And that was kind of my thing, is, like, I realized that, like, there are certain exploits you can do with that. For instance, um, Petrol was one of my very first characters with 3rd Edition. I really wanted to do... I, in 2nd Edition, I did martial arts. And I wanted to play a martial artist again. I looked at single points shining into the void. I was going to be that guy with a katana going, nothing personnel, kid. And I was like, well, I'm a solar. I have single point shining into the void. Here's the thing with, with martial arts. They basically went, oh, so if you're a solar martial artist and you have martial arts supernal, which means that you are a even that you are specifically someone who specs into that particular ability, you gain better abilities because it's not something oh you're I'm just gonna go into I'm just I'm just doing it as a hobby. No, it's like no, you are this is your life now. Yeah. Welcome to martial art. This is your life. You come with free nunchucks. <laughs> um, free nunchucks and a mask. Yes. Uh, and here's the thing, though. As a solar, you get a lot of abilities. You get a lot of things that just open up as a martial artist. Yeah. Actually, uh, we both went into martial arts in that circle, funny enough. And here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. For a single point shining into the void... You you get to basically act twice as often as you would otherwise because it doesn't count just your tempo, as I was saying before. It counts your sword's tempo too. Yep. Now you can you can flavor this in a number of different ways. Either you're acting just because you're so fast, or like your sword has like it's you basically you get like a sword stand. I basically flavored it that I was just acting so quickly because yeah, my she was just that fast just, my old yeah. notes list her as samurai batman with high levels of investigation she never used and murdered people she really should have left alive mm. <laughs> is that fair you think no that's that's pretty fair that's pretty fair <laughs> i basically was playing her as the logical conclusion to the way i've always kind of viewed batman that they were Incredibly paranoid. They were uh, 
very, very, very analytical, very coldly pragmatic, and also pretty sociopathically crazy. Yep. And here's the thing, like, you can argue, I suppose, with certain iterations of Batman, because Batman, I I feel part of the problem with the character is, first off, he's been philanderized a lot, mm. and secondly, um, he, just over the course of the years, you kind of see some where it's like he's a very tortured person who's trying to, you know, do good in the world, and you can debate as to whether or not he does. Yeah. Or you can go, he's just a, a freaking crazy person who is just coping with the death of his parents, you know, by being a crazy person. He's basically a man-child who's trying desperately to cope with something that he's never come to terms with. Yeah. Which is, I mean, that's understandable. You know, losing your parents to violence is not easy to deal with. Uh, you know, I... Yep. And that, that would be traumatic and life-altering. But, but then uh, there's a lot of people who also write him as Detective Jesus, and he's just, I always have the plan, and it doesn't matter that I'm just a dude in a suit and a voice changer. Yeah. I'd say he actually changes his voice. I always just say I'd have assumed that he spoke in a very gruff way. Yeah, and it's just, but, uh... he's way, <laughs> way, like, ah, oh, planning is my superpower. It's like, yeah, okay, knowing something is coming and even being prepared for it does not mean you're actually ready for it when time comes. Yeah, as Mike Tyson says, you know, everyone has a plan up until the point where they get punched in the face. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> That being said, I basically played her as a crazy person who was constantly, you know, just kind of being sneaky, constantly paranoid that people were constantly following her, and just kind of being a, a weirdo with a sword who would just kill people for for just really flippant reasons. Yep, and part of uh, that is the only friend you had... Was me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was trying to basically have her be a very erratic kind of... And that, that was intentional. I wasn't just being a lull, so random. Yeah. Um, I was trying to be have her that be that way. And the, unfortunately, I suppose the problem being is that I was going for... I had already kind of done the big damn hero thing before with a number of characters. It was really fun. I was trying to do something a little bit uh, a little bit edgier, and I don't think certain other people really got that, which is unfortunate. Yeah, this party had a lot of issues, and not the least of which was... Um, I didn't know what I was doing, and rather than asking questions, I tended to just remain quiet a lot. And... My character was Sunset Shimmer, and yes, I snuck a little pony joke into an exalted table, and they didn't get it right away. None of them actually knew. It wasn't until almost the very end of the game that I explained that. Because none of us were bronies, dude. That's the thing. Like, I, I suspected, because I had heard the name before, but I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kick that hornet's nest. <laughs> well, I was a martial artist as well. I went into Righteous Devil, which, Righteous Devil is flamethrower foo. <laughs> and it's a very fun, very interesting type of, of fighting. And the problem that I had was Sunset kind of lacked a general direction for her character. Um, I didn't really come up with anything to make her stand out. And while she was really strong, like she was great as a combat role, that's really all she had going for her. So I learned a lot uh, by making those mistakes pretty early on. And she's actually one of those few characters I've thought about uh, reconfiguring and reusing at some point in the future, because I think there's some good potential there that I didn't tap. Yeah, I was about to say, you kind of had the meme where it's like, I would, we had a kind of a hammer and anvil thing going on, where it's like, <laughs> uh, I would distract them, and you would just, as I say, um, uh, certain, certain attack styles, just, some of them didn't really matter, your tempo you could just do huge attacks anyway yep and sunshine shimmer was kind of a, a meme memed for this is that uh, she just would end combat by just <laughs> i enter combat pull gun <laughs> shoot gun person dies it's like oh as, as it turns okay. out fire is one of those things that's really difficult to block and to cope with even if you have magical defensive powers 
a lot of them are like, oh, by the way, fire is like one of those things that just kind of ignores and overrules all these conditions. And yeah, I had to get fairly close. I think it was a mid-range weapon. But I basically just walk into combat, fire gun, and leave combat. <laughs> Yeah, it's about, um, did you actually get the prayer piece that we were joking about, or was that a Not for Sunset. That was actually a later character who ultimately had that. Um, Sunset, I think, had the, essentially the pistol version of one of these weapons, and the only downside to them is the ammo for them is rare and difficult to make. And so I spent pretty much any money that came into my pockets went into maintaining my weapons, (laughs) <laughs> just because these things are not super common in the world. Oh, they're, yeah. they're not, like, rare, they're not unheard of, it's just maintaining them is expensive. Outside of the South, yes. In the South, it's it's relatively common because the fire dust, the actual fuel for the weapons, comes from that area. Yeah, and we weren't uh, in the South at the time, so it cost me a pretty yeah. penny. And then our buddies, yeah. we had uh, Hrothgar who had the defining intimacy of ultra-violence and a major intimacy of what a nice guy the bloodthirsty Viking was. You see, you guys see a problem here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was at least interesting. He, um, as I recall, he had a situation where he was going, trying to go down a mountain, and he body-surfed a bear yep. halfway down. I remember that, and we were just kind of off to the side watching him. It's like, is this happening? Is this a fever dream? <laughs> yeah, he was just like, I'm gonna nail the landing, because he, like, he was falling through the air. He <laughs> saw the bear in his path. He's like, you know what? I'm not gonna get out of the way. I'm gonna surf on the bear down the mountain, and it's like, <laughs> okay, alright. Hey, he owned it, so I, I can't even complain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there was Ivan Drago. Ivan I Drago. believe we basically bullied into that name. Yeah, he was originally just Drago, and the, his his player had a hard time settling on a backstory, so we, we started referring to him as Ivan Drago, man of 1,000 backstories. Yeah, and so like he would just start going off, and then we would just start adding on <laughs> things to his backstory. It was a build-your-own-character story. <laughs> yeah, it, it was... It, it was, it was, uh... I think we ultimately said he was from the Hundred Kingdoms, according to my notes, but we never actually went there, and, like, his grandfather was apparently King of the Pirates or something, and we never really made good on any of that, and I don't think we ever bothered bringing it up again later on. No, although I'm pretty sure we actually encounter his grandfather in a later game, where we were pirates. Oh, that's right, we did! We, we actually did, I forgot about that. We'll get to that in a minute. That's a little bit in the future. Um, I was actually... I missed a good number of the games uh, during this time. So I had an instance once where we were making plans to assassinate these nobles. And they were bad dudes and they had ties to the mafia. So I was like, yeah, if we, if we kill them, we'll be doing the, you know society a greater good. And I miss a session and come back and we were suddenly 200 miles away. And I'm like, what do you mean we didn't kill the nobles? Yeah, we literally, we agreed, we took money, we were going to the hit, and then three of the other people were like, no. And we just left, and I'm like, what do you mean you just left? (laughs) They just left. We just left. One of my notes. And I'm like, oh my god, you know what? We are in so much trouble right now. I gotta gotta go with you guys, because you know what? It's, we gotta stay together. This is not a good idea. We just skipped town. We just skipped town. One of my notes is I botched an intelligence check and declared that a large squid-like creature was in fact an aquatic horse. Oh, yeah. I don't know why, but I wrote that down for some reason. <laughs> That must have been really funny. Uh, yeah, the didn't time. you didn't you decide to tame it? And so you oh yeah, I did, and, and I actually had a, this is a pet that would follow me in the nearest body of water it could because it could, literally could not go on land due to its size. Mm-hmm. I forget what I named it, and I don't have it written down. Um, mm-hmm. I think the game ended not long after that, if my notes are any indication, unless you remember something. Uh, yeah, I think I think I went and found my old. Uh, 
my old city that my past incarnation as Kestrel the Slayer had. Right. And uh, I was establishing a city there. And I believe I, uh, yeah, that was it. We kind of ended it, ended that particular campaign there. Yep. And then we had um, our campaign in hell. Yes, literally. Literally hell, uh, because in Exalted, hell is a place you can just go. Mm-hmm. And you can also leave under certain mm-hmm. circumstances, if you know what you're doing, apparently. 